Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Daily Bolt with your host, Dr. Jeff Tilley. Today's topic, Nestor is just the latest in tropical storm oddities this season. Sit back and relax and enjoy today's Daily Bolt. Okay, so over the weekend, uh, it is the weekend of the 19th, 20th of October, 2019. And over this weekend, we had the oddity that has been sort of tropical storm Nestor uh, impact the Gulf Coast and the southeastern U.S. and eventually the Mid-Atlantic. I say the oddity because Nestor has been anything but a typical tropical system. In fact, it only was classified as a tropical system for maybe 18 hours or so. Uh, on Friday into Saturday. And it's, it's an odd system. Uh, it began in the southwestern Gulf of Mexico, which is not unusual for uh, mid to late October in terms of tropical cyclones. And uh, really never had a tropical appearance until it got relatively close to the Gulf Coast. Uh, it's been this very difficult to classify system. It didn't have really enough tropical characteristics to call it a tropical storm for much of the first couple days of its existence. And it really didn't have quite a subtropical appearance either, nor an extra tropical. It just was kind of this odd cyclone that for uh, a couple of days was referred to by the National Hurricane Center as potential uh, tropical cyclone, uh, Nestor or tropical cyclone 16. Uh, and anyway, uh, long story short, eventually Nestor got close enough to the Florida uh, coastline, uh, the west coast, the Gulf coasts of Florida, to eventually cause uh, some significant storm surge uh, with relatively strong winds. Uh, some tornadoes were spawned, and yet it uh, was not a tropical storm for very long. As I said, maybe 18 hours or so before it started making a transition to being a post-tropical or an extra-tropical cyclone before it even made landfall uh, on the Gulf Coast and tracked across the southeast uh, U.S. yesterday and now into the open Atlantic where it's affecting uh, still parts of the southeast coast but the mid-Atlantic coast and will gradually be dissipating over the next day or so. Uh, it's been a very strange system. It's going to be one of the interesting ones to maybe to look at from a research standpoint to try and figure out exactly uh, what was going on besides the fact that we didn't know how to classify it, it did have significant winds up to 50 miles an hour or so uh, and was even forecast to get close to hurricane strength uh, at one point without even being a tropical or a subtropical or an extra tropical storm. A uh, very unusual system. And it highlights that this entire tropical storm season has itself been very unusual with uh, its storms that have existed. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time in these podcasts this fall going through much of the tropical storms, even though we went from Dorian all the way to Nestor, D to N, and I hadn't really made another podcast or even commented on uh, the tropical systems themselves, other than uh, a little bit in the last podcast re relating to tropical storm Imelda over the southeast Texas coast. And that's partly because many of the tropical systems uh, either were very short-lived, uh, like Nestor, or they weren't much of a threat to any land interests. Uh, and we'll, I'm going to go through some of these uh, tropical storms uh, since Dorian, and Dorian itself was unusual for how it basically stalled over the Bahamas and battered the Bahamas uh, before approaching the U.S. coast, and then uh, not really being as big of a deal along the U.S. coast as it could have been. So after Hurricane Dorian, we had Tropical Storm Aaron in late August, which lasted perhaps two and a half days. Uh, and as far as it goes, uh, it really didn't make much of an impact. Uh, it was a tropical 
uh, depression that formed midway between Bermuda and the United States and moved eastward, and there were no real hazards affecting land. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and it never really got uh, that far on its path towards Bermuda before becoming an extratropical mo, and then it's moving on and uh, going into the mid-latitude westerlies. That was Aaron. Then we had Tropical Storm Fernand, and this began as another tropical cyclone over the southwestern Gulf of Mexico. This really just impacted northeastern Mexico, and it didn't last very long either. Uh, it basically was perhaps uh, uh, just under 48 hours uh, in terms of its lifetime, a very short-lived tropical storm, not particularly powerful. Then there's Tropical Storm Gabrielle, which uh, was uh, in existence during the first week of September. And this formed in the eastern tropical Atlantic, uh, quite, away, quite far away, uh, just off the coast of the Cape Verde Islands, which is actually very typical for many tropical cyclones. And ultimately, uh, Gabrielle was mostly uh, of concern to the Azores and became an extratropical cyclone towards the end of its week-long life. Uh, we move next to Hurricane Umberto. This is the most significant of the storms that occurred between Dorian and Nestor, and yet you probably never heard of it because it spent most of its lifetime over open water and only began to uh, affect uh, Bermuda uh, late in its lifetime, and then it continued uh, to affect Bermuda until it eventually dissipated about 600 or so miles to the northeast of Bermuda. Now, why is Umberto so noteworthy? Umberto actually became a very strong Category 5 hurricane. Uh, and it, it achieved that Category 5 status while it was relatively far north in its trajectory uh, over relatively colder waters than you might expect a Category 5 storm to be present at. And it set a record for the strongest hurricane to be that far north and east in the Atlantic Basin in recorded history. Now, granted, that only goes back about 100 years at, at most. But still, it broke a, a record for how strong of a storm existed that far north and that far east. That makes it noteworthy, even though there were relatively little impacts to very uh, many uh, people. Uh, Bermuda bore the brunt of Umberto. It was not a Category 5 when it went through uh, Bermuda, more like a category, high Category 2, low Category 3, which is still significant. But did you really hear much about it? Not really. Next, we had Jerry. And Jerry began as a tropical depression over the central tropical Atlantic. And uh, like Gabrielle and, and like uh, Umberto, did not really make a big impact on very many land areas. Uh, it actually moved into the northern Leeward Islands. Uh, it got close to Puerto Rico. It got close to the uh, Virgin Islands, but it was never a particularly strong hurricane, mostly a minimal hurricane, spent much of its lifetime as a strong tropical storm, and as a result, uh, you didn't hear a lot about it. Uh, there were a few news stories I, I recall about Jerry approaching uh, the Virgin Islands, uh, the other uh, Leeward Islands in the Caribbean, and the fact that it might impact Puerto Rico once again. Uh, but it was not a especially strong storm compared to other ones that have uh, passed by the Caribbean uh, this season. And it lasted about a week, a fairly typical life cycle for a hurricane. Then we have Tropical Storm Imelda, which, uh, much like Harvey did a couple of seasons ago, moved into southeast Texas and effectively stalled and fell apart. 
and uh, advisories from the National Hurricane Center were only uh, issued for about a day and a half. And then uh, there were rainfall advisories as the remnants of Imelda just refused to die quickly and continued to dump lots of rain on southeast Texas, much like Harvey did two years ago. If anything, this uh, uh, close repeat of a relatively heavy rainfall event, though the rainfall totals were less than Harvey's, it still suggests that maybe this type of event is a little bit more common than we might have thought. Or is it climate change? Well, if you talk to the weather attribution folks, like I mentioned in the last podcast, they think it's climate change. Uh, I still am working through some of the material on weather attribution, and I have another podcast coming up on what I think about it, but it's not quite ready yet. After Imelda, we had Tropical Storm Karen in late September. Tropical Storm Karen formed just east of the Windward Islands, relatively far south in the Caribbean, initially a threat to Trinidad and Tobago. Then this also uh, moved towards Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, with tropical storm forced winds and heavy rainfall relatively early in its life cycle. Uh, It moved relatively close to... Uh, the Puerto Rican capital of San Juan uh, in late September and eventually degenerated into a remnant low north of the Caribbean and again making no real uh, pass towards uh, the U.S. coast or thankfully again uh, much of the Bahamas. Uh, And you didn't hear a whole lot about Karen. Again, uh, it seems that unless the storm is going to make a run at the U.S. uh, in terms of the forecasts, you don't hear a whole lot about it. You might see it on a national newscast, but you don't have a whole lot of media coverage on it. Of course, the media these days has been so focused on politics and impeachment and other stuff that, yeah, other news time kind of gets uh, ignored. So following uh, 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 Karen, we had Lorenzo, another hurricane. This uh, basically began uh, as a tropical cyclone late September, carried on into early October. Lorenzo uh, was another hurricane that basically affected the Azores island chain and not a lot else, uh, spending a lot of its time over over open water in the central Atlantic. Uh, It was a significant hurricane, but it also uh, largely uh, caused relatively minimal effects. It was... uh, not a particularly strong hurricane through most of its lifetime, and uh, but it was long lived and uh, lasted a good ten days. Tropical storm Melissa is next. Uh, this was in mid October, just a, about a week ago, and tropical storm Melissa basically was the outgrowth of the bomb cyclone that. Uh, struck New England, and this is another one of the oddities in that you have a strong extratropical cyclone that suddenly becomes subtropical and then acquires tropical characteristics, which does not happen frequently at all. Uh, It's a very rare sequence of events, and uh, it's very interesting to see, again, how much of a research topic Melissa will be in terms of uh, making a transition in high latitudes, the reverse of what is normally expected. Then we have uh, Tropical Depression 15, which was occurring pretty much about the same time. Uh, This uh, was a weak tropical depression that formed off the coast of West Africa, where many tropical cyclones begin. Uh, It was at best a tropical depression, and Uh, It lasted perhaps about 30 hours before dissipating. Not a long storm at all. And then we had Nestor, which I've already mentioned. So we've had a lot of atypical 
tropical cyclones in terms of uh, this particular season. And we've also had some typical ones that just didn't have any impacts because they stayed in the central Atlantic. So if you're wondering why I chose not to spend a lot of time on tropical cyclones, well, you kind of have uh, the basic idea. And the season still has another month to go. So we'll see if we get any other cyclones that make a big run at the U.S. or that are particularly strong. The Pacific Basin has had some very powerful uh, uh, tropical cyclones and typhoons, the largest one uh, striking Japan last week uh, and uh, eventually having the effects of the remnant storm uh, strike uh, the Aleutian Island chain and be a hazard to shipping interests in the Bering Sea. But since I hadn't said anything about tropical cyclones for quite some time since Dorian, I felt it was worth doing a bit of a recap. As I said, it's been a bit of an odd season and one that hasn't attracted a lot of attention since Dorian uh, with a brief uh, a bit of attention on, on Jerry, Imelda, and Nestor. Uh, but perhaps that's a good thing. Perhaps a relatively uneventful season as far as the U.S. coast is a good thing. On that note, I'm going to conclude today's Daily Bolt. I'm Dr. Jeff Tilley. Have a good day wherever you are, and God bless.